Morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to Strategy Cafe. Um, we have, as you know, been doing a series on family business. And um, if you didn't see it, the last one was, I thought, very cool. I really loved it. Um, I met up with Philip McEwen, who's um, uh, one of the family business leaders from Musgraves, which is a big international uh, food business and we recorded it in Bewley's Cafe in, in Dublin, which was incredibly cool on the day of his book launch around, um, you know, how to be a successor, a book by successors for successors. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, it's a great discussion. Uh, you can find it and all past episodes of, of this uh, podcast and discussion on our YouTube channel. If you go and look for Alembic strategy on YouTube, you'll find uh, Philip and my discussion there. And um, we uh, act for uh, family businesses and founders. And so we've kind of taken a bit of a swerve uh, uh, this season. And we're going to have a few just on this idea of, of founding a business. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to, to Matt in just a second. And we're going to you know talk about various different aspects of being a founder. But I just thought I'd kick off um, uh, by saying, um, you know, founders are a kind of peculiar bunch. Um, I know, I know I've got Matt on the line here, so I feel like I might be being seen to be a bit rude here, but um, I feel like I can say that because uh, I'm also a founder. So really, I'm just talking about me. Um, and, um, you know, they come from all sorts of different directions. And I think one of the things that would be really interesting to talk about today with Matt is, you know, just what drives him, what drove him to become a founder uh, and whether he kind of shares, you know, uh, like with me and with others, you know, some of the some of those sort of facets of being, being a founder, sort of the challenges, the difficulties, the problems, the opportunities. Um, so yeah, so it should be a really good chat. Before we get started, uh, this week, uh, I have been focusing in my meditation practice uh, on uh, Metta Bhavana, which is, some of you may know, is the practice of loving kindness. And so just before we get going and I introduce Matt, um, I'll just stop the share for a second. Uh, I'm just going to invite everyone just to take um, a couple of deep breaths and settle into being here. So, uh, deep breath in, and relax and breathe out gently. And maybe one more. Yeah, and just notice. If you join me in breathing, you know how it helps relax a little, how it helps you just focus on being here, being with me and Matt. Um, and in the tradition of Metta Bhavana, I wanted just to um, wish you well, uh, wish you happiness, uh, wish you freedom from suffering. So, right. Um, welcome, Matt. Um, I'm just going to put the uh, slide back up and um, let you uh, give everyone a bit of an intro to you. So um, welcome to the webinar. Tell everyone about you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Nick. So I guess uh, I've worked in financial services for, for a long time. Um, and uh, we find ourselves here talking about being a founder because I made the jump and started 10th Bridge back in 2020. Um, and I think uh, there are <laughs> lots of stories along the way that led to that point. Um, working in financial services, particularly throughout the run-up to and the and, and the aftermath of two thousand eight, um, carries a lifetime of experiences. But I think uh, you know here we are. I think um, we're going to talk about some great things, um, which I think. I, I'm, I'm expecting Nick that the conversation we're going to have is more about some of the the thoughts and 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 the behaviours and the approach around that. And I think that's what's really exciting about some of this is actually taking some time to reflect on that and uh, trying to answer some of those questions myself. Oh uh, yeah, so look wonderful. Um, but look before we get into that, I'm going to just ask the people who are on the uh, on the um, uh, the uh, webinar this morning. Um, you know, where they're at with this. So I'm just going to launch a poll quickly to get a view from those watching, um, you know, what's your what's your position as you tune into this? So we asked the question, you know, are you a founder? Do you work with a founder? Do you want to be a founder? 
Okay, so we've got 33% um, are founders, 17% um, uh, work with a founder, and 50% uh, want to be a founder. Interesting. Sure. Yeah. Um, right, well, um, Matt, why the hell did you become a founder? <laughs> Very good question. Um, I think there's a combination of factors that you kind of look at it from a, a both a, a, a pull and a push perspective. So I think, you know, I can't remember the point at which I first had the thought, but I think it's something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Mm. Um, it goes back many, many years. And I think that, so that 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 sort of desire has, has always been there. Um, I think, you know, the, the things that sort of got in the way of doing that is again, you know, I mentioned I worked in financial services for a long time. That was a very busy, quite a lucrative career. I mean, I'd say relatively stable given you know there is volatility in that market and you don't necessarily I think certainly speaking personally didn't feel the dis-ease to go mm. and do something so exactly. you know for me it was the the pull was there but perhaps the push wasn't quite strong enough to to go and do it and I think you know we look at what happened sort of later on without going through all the sort of the blow by blow account of my career I finished up in in banking sort of nine years ago and thought, you know, I, I'm, I was at a pivot point and what what do I do next? Um, I know it's not what I've been doing, but I'm not quite sure what that is. And it, it, it cut a long story short, I went, I went back into consulting, um, ended up working for a, an organization, a boutique consultancy, helped to, to build, you know, a big, big part of the consulting revenue stream. And uh, it got to a point where quite simply, I think, you know, me and my boss at the time just didn't see eye to eye about how the future was going to go, um, which kind of helped because then there's a choice to make. You know, my boss is also the CEO, founder and majority shareholder. So, you know, realistically, you're never going to win that argument if, if you if you have a differing view. So, you know, life's all about choices. And I think that was the point where it's like, well, if I'm not going to do it now, then when am I, when am I going to do it? Um, it, it kind of helped that it was right in the middle of the pandemic or early stages of the pandemic. So mm. I'd be lying if I think there weren't a few pinch me moments thinking, what have I done? Um, but yeah, it, 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 it was a long time coming. And I think, you know, the, the good point is, and I'm sure we'll talk some more about this, but, you know, look back and, you know, absolutely no regrets whatsoever. Really interesting. Um, and uh, I definitely relate so one of the questions I have, I guess, I guess, um, you know, uh, what you're saying there is that you had it in your mind that you wanted to found a business. Mm. Um, and I wonder how many people carry that because you get to this point where, as you say, you know, it's a it's a kind of a, you know, a decision point with you and your your boss. Uh, and not many people say, well, the obvious solution to that is to find found my own business. Um, but there's a particular kind of mindset that goes with that, right? Which says that rather than getting another job somewhere else, that's a step up and there's like maybe more pay and it's maybe a restart and it's more interesting and, you know, see this job as a stepping stone. So you start to sort of work out what your career move is. It's like where most people's minds would be at. So what is it do you think that's particularly, you know, peculiar to use my earlier words uh, to found? I think it's, it says yeah. founding is the right answer. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, and, and I think I think it's a, it's it's a really sort of good thing to ponder on because I think as part again another part of as the passage of time goes, you know, I think well certainly I speak personally, I have become more self aware, um, and the self awareness is yeah you know, I kind of know what I'm good at, yeah, but equally I also know the things that I need to avoid um, right. because I am predisposed to not react well in those kind of situations, so. You know, I can take the view, which is, you know, there's there's some things that, uh, you know, you suck it up and move on. And let's face it, we all have those situations. Doesn't matter what you do, um, or you can try and look at it to set yourself up to succeed. And the alignment between being a founder, being your own boss, the freedom to set the strategy and the course, and then also the ability to execute on that. Yeah. There's there's nowhere to hide. This is down to you. There's no excuses. You can't point to somebody else. And I think, you know, those are the situations that I thrive in. In, in a more sort of uh, traditional structure, I know that that's where I start to hit the buffers that, that you know, might cause me problems individually. So, you know, what I'm describing might not work for somebody else because, you know, I, certainly I know 
other people who are the complete opposite in terms of you know find that that stability and that security enables them to do their best work so being a founder and the risk and the uncertainty that goes along with that might actually be something that would completely ruin their strong point so so i think that that for me is is kind of you know that inherent view of what is important to you and how you thrive and the environment has, has kind of all contributed to that i think as well they're great points i'm just going to share the slides again so i think um on this one we've kind of got some of that conversation we just had you know been there for a long time for whatever reason time to make the leap um I, my sense is though that and we get on to you know you make the you make the jump you you become a founder you get on the other side of the fence we'll talk about that in a minute and you know the crushing reality of being a founder as opposed to the hopes and dreams of wanting to found something we'll come on to that in just a second but my sense is that it's this last one here and i think there's a really interesting dialogue here and I, like i I, sh I feel like i share this with you um uh, in in my soul uh as well which is that um um uh, you know the perceived lack of opportunity where you were as a senior employee knowing knowing you had the skills knowing you knew what you were doing and uh having that sense of freedom i guess of knowing you didn't need to work for somebody else must be inherently in there so there's some neutrality around being employed and um you know um needing to be dependent on some other thing so mm -hmm. the thing i want to bring up here is this this stepping into opportunity which is obviously the big pull factor rather than push and um what goes with that is um complete risk like an openness to complete risk right does that relate do you do you have that thought when you did it? It, it 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 is and i think you know again this is where again speaking personally right this is where my style of doing things kind of leans well into that because you know <laughs> whether there's a a sort of misplaced sense of overconfidence or just a a belief um is is that you'll find a way through it and i think you know a lot of a, a lot of sort of my journey to get to that point is there's been some great things that have happened i think you know, if i look at some of the better things that happened throughout my career it was where it was a pivot point and it was a decision that you know was based on i, I hesitate to say gut feel because that really doesn't kind of do it justice but it was something where did I have all of the data and the facts and had I analyzed it every which way to think about upside and downside and then made a choice and the answer is no but if I look at those key points those are the things that led to the biggest upside and yeah. the next opportunities and the next one so, so I think from that point of view you know getting comfortable with that almost as stepping stones kind of helped me yeah. and, and I know that my personality type is something that I'll I'll kind of you know get stuck in and and, and have this belief and you know maybe figure it out afterwards which is you know can hold you back um in important moments but i think you know again it, it it's it's as you said is that inner belief that you think there's an opportunity there's there's absolute risk associated with it but what's the worst that could happen yeah and yeah like I, I really relate to that and i think so in a way you could you could uh, think about it like being an expert better uh, and I'm going to qualify that comment in a minute because it's not like that. But in a way, it is like if you really know your, um, you know, your favorite sport, let's say, um, and uh, you know what's going on uh, or like, you know, buy, buying and selling shares in the in the stock exchange in the market. Right. And you're a good analyst and you've got a lot of experience as an investment director and you kind of know how to do it and you know what you're looking for. So you, I would say you've got a lot of understanding of the form. Uh, but then, you know, a wise better uh, also knows that there's never enough information and you've just got to take a bit of a punt. So that idea of taking a risk. Mm -hmm. But then just to qualify that it's not like betting, and I think this will make sense, you're sort of betting on yourself to be able to problem solve what happens next. I think that's the key point of difference. So you are taking that bet, but you're not betting on somebody else and being out of control. You're betting on yourself to be able to problem solve what's coming up. And I think that, for me, is a kind of key connection. I, I, I completely agree. And I think it's, you know, you look, you can look at that in terms of the positive experiences. I can also relate to that in terms of, you know, certain negative experiences yeah. throughout my career where that didn't happen for reasons. And I, I you know, I, I said to anybody who's prepared to listen, you know, one of the worst feelings that I've had is when, you know, I was involved in something that didn't go well. Yeah. And it was because of something I did because I followed somebody else's advice against my better judgment. Yeah. And it was a, I mean, it was a, it was a very powerful lesson to learn quite early on. Yeah. It, with hindsight, it wasn't a huge thing, 
it felt like it at the time but it's you know I have no worries whatsoever about something failing because of something that I believed in and put everything into and really drove forward but I never want to feel like I could have done it a different way because I went against my instincts or judgment because of somebody else's view and that's that's a terror because you kind of lose agency in that in that, in that feeling as well and I think that's what it comes down to is that the risk bit is also well it's down to you to control and decide and figure out how you want to move forward and and that's quite empowering I think it's hugely empowering I want to come back to it as well because I think you know for people like you and maybe a bit like me it's also a massive source of uh found founder bias but um but it also is at the heart of it um but let's just move on a little bit and talk about uh so you know so what was that like I think when we were chatting about this um we both kind of uh, remembering a famous book uh, on founding a business by Michael Gerber, mm-hmm. which I haven't referenced here on the slide, but uh, it's called The E Myth for anyone who wants to read it. And it was, you know, bestseller in the noughties, I think. Um, and he kind of talks about this a little bit, but, you know, you, you go ahead, you take that leap of faith, you know, you back yourself, you found a business. <clears throat> how, how much was it as you expected it to be on the other side? Did you find, you know, freedom and opportunity or, or, or was it maybe not quite like that? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I I think it's, I mean, look, it's, it's very positive. I said earlier, you know, absolutely no regrets. Um, not, not that I live my life with regrets anyway, but, but I think for, for me, the, the, the sort of the last few years have been, it's been a huge number of positives, right? I think, um, mo- and, and mostly positives, but I think that, again, it comes back to links back to a little bit of our previous conversation or previous topic, which is, you know, it does come with challenges. There are many things um, that could be considered banana skins or landmines that, you know, you you have to be resilient to deal with those. And I think sometimes I I look at it and think, and in fact, I've had conversations with other founders and I've said, you know, there are certain things that I'd, I'd probably say, yeah, I'd, I'd give myself an A plus in terms of, you know, how that bit went because it exceeded all expectations. Um, other things, you know, kind of died in the ditch. Um, yeah. yeah. And, wouldn't wouldn't have expected that at the time but they did and i think this is this is the other point about you know sort of leaning into that risk and the and the control and the freedom is you know, you have to have that flexibility and i think if i'd held on to ideas that i believed in fully several years ago um that hadn't sort of moved forward then that would have robbed me of the time to then pivot onto the things that were delivering success and have doubled down on so so i think you know a lot of a lot of positives um some negatives but again you know it's it's working the way through that to not let them knock you off the course i think there's been some real kind of eye-opening moments as well mm. um i think the one for me that again this kind of rams it home to you as being as being a founder and what it means and the, and the fact there's nobody else to fall back on um is i remember the first the first time that uh a client uh didn't pay yeah not, not because not because they weren't going to pay it was a screw up um yeah. and then you look at your cash flow and you think i can't pay my bills <laughs> and i can't pay my staff yeah. and it's you know the, it's, an adrenaline, it's an adrenaline it's an adrenaline moment isn't it i think it, uh, uh, adrenaline <laughs> doesn't well i mean yeah a, a massive dose um let's, and, let's, and say, let's, say, could, let's say it's a rush <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to, to all the 50 odd percent on the poll about who want to do this, um, I don't want to put you off. But, um, you know, these these are the things that you kind of you encounter. But but I think, you know, that that's where then it's it's getting getting your sort of rational part of your brain thinking again, because ultimately, you know, part of what I do is problem solving. Yes. Um, so let's turn that in on myself. And you know, that that particular situation came down to, OK, what are the things that I can actually control? Mm. And it came down to making a lot of phone calls, Um, you know, and and frankly, calling in some favours from some friendly client staff who were prepared to step in and help out. And, and it's fine, here we are. But I think, you know, that one is, is, you know, the, the, the catastrophizing that happens at that point in time, about the what ifs, and if I can't swear, I can't, you know, you can see how that goes. And, and, And again, it's bringing it back to what can I actually do? To move this forward but but that that for me was really an interesting moment because it's like yeah okay we're, we're not playing around anymore this is quite serious 
Um, so and, that, and other that, people are dependent on you. Yeah. Have, have you adjusted your um, your um, resilience uh, strategy as a consequence? Uh, yes, yes. I think um, well, a couple of couple of ways in which I've, I've done that. One is kind of being a bit more robust about how much liquidity you need um, mm. in terms of commitment. So you know, more of a financial resilience. Um, and then the other one is you know the the, the personal resilience so I, I guess I'm I'm lucky in the sense that you know again the career I've had should we say there have been plenty of opportunities to develop resilience throughout that mm -hmm. period of time um and knowing yourself is important as well I mean you you, you know it's, it's still uh, there are points of discovery um where something new happens and you you I, I, I can't remember the phrase you used sort of five ten minutes ago but it's it's kind of having the, the tool set that you can fall back on yeah. and figure out okay this is how I can put that together so so I think in terms of you know the adjustment is that continued learning about what's important um and then looking structurally at what can I do to try and avoid that situation in the first place so I don't have to rely on the personal resilience about not being able to pay bills so because it's not it's not a nice situation to be in I think this is it's a, a lovely conversation and it kind of for me it roots it really into the experience of being a founder just so beautifully um you know on the one hand uh you got your tool deck um mm -hmm. and you have your kind of uh your experience your knowledge of the past your uh confidence on your own ability to solve problems but now you're facing novel problems and then as we're just talking about it like there's the emotional roller coaster ride where um you know uh, things are happening that are driving your attention i've got to pay attention to this i've got to pay attention to this yep. and one of my yep. mentors once said to me you know uh, the founder goes where it's hot in the business and solves that. And so sometimes that's building growth and building new and yeah, heading a, heading away. And other times it's solving immediate issues that could be a massive bear pit, a trap, a problem, you know. And so you sort of you get to this sort of emotional up and down analytical combination where you need a tool deck to that you used to to use flexibly to solve literally anything that might happen. And every day is every day is a new problem. Right. So, but, you know, in a way, after a while, I don't know how you feel about this, but you kind of get, look forward to the problems. And it's, it sounds a bit crazy, but um, it's actually quite fun. Uh, yeah. I, I think I think there's a, uh, lots of <clears throat> excuse me, lots of thoughts on, on that particular point. I think, you know, just just in terms of the day job and the client work that we do, you know, quite often that ends up being quite challenging by its very nature. And sometimes sure. you sit there and think, oh, why have I signed up for this? Um, <laughs> It's pretty obvious why, but but you know that that's that's again is we're kind of run towards danger in many respects because the reality is clients don't hire us to do the easy stuff because right. they can do that themselves. Yeah. So you know naturally you're you're putting yourself in a situation where you're encountering those by desire. So you know that 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 that's kind of the bit that you know is again it's part of the day job and that's about helping somebody else and it's kind of easier to project i think that you know one of the other thoughts related to your point is you know there's a there's a former colleague and, and friend of mine who is the ceo of a um but well, it's not a tech startup anymore it's it's actually grown um pretty strongly but is you know he describes he's the ceo and he describes the e as it stands for everything yeah um, which which i think you know to your point about you go where it's hot and yeah. you have to be you have to be involved in that because you don't have the processes and structures that you have as part of a a, a more stable, larger organization that's spent a long time building those systems and processes. So, you know, that's that's something that, again, it depends on what you enjoy and what gives you fulfillment. But for me, that also gives a lot of the freedom that we talk about, right? Because, <clears throat> you know, I, I, it, it's not just about what problems come up, but it's, yeah. you know, how am I going to drive things forward today? What am I going to do this week? And yeah. each week can be very different in that respect. So, you know, again, to to those on the on the call who want to be founders, you know, if, if that resonates, then it's it's incredibly rewarding to, to go and do that. I've got a, a question for you about the, um, you know, I don't know whether, how you feel about this, but uh, just... Um, uh, so, uh, you know, as you say, uh, clients don't want you to do the easy stuff because they can do that themselves and they're not going to pay you for that. They want you to go and help them do the stuff that they don't know how to do or they don't have the capacity mm -hmm. for. Right. So those are the two kind of areas of value add in, a, in an advisory like, uh, like our businesses, Matt. Um, and uh, as you say, so you're problem solving really hard stuff. You don't have control of the situation like you're not normally a decision maker. 
you're an influencer, right? When you're an advisor, you're not the decision maker. Um, so you're influencing other people to make choices and make decisions and do things uh, ultimately. Um, so there's a sort of curious difference in the sense that you've got to problem solve through the medium of other people who are in the, the, the client business and you're somewhat more neutral about that, but you're still using all of these kind of, I'm going to call them the science of business. And then we'll talk about mm -hmm. that in a second, you know, iterative problem solving skills, right? You're using all of that toolbox, uh, and experience to help them do that. And I wonder whether that gives you more perspective on your own, uh, founder problems or whether it, did it help? Does it not help? Yeah. It, it, it it kind of does and I, i'm not i'm not sure i've ever sort of been very um structured about drawing that that comparison but but again there's a lot of things that you build inherently um and and do but but i think i think it's right and i guess that the way <clears throat> and th this is going to come out slightly wrong but but hopefully it'll make sense is the, the the way in which i engage with clients and what gives me the freedom in terms of, you know, and sometimes I get very immersed in what their, their issues are, yeah. almost behaving as if you were an employee of that organization. Yeah. But fundamentally not. And, and the reason I say that is because, you know, that, that separation, that ability to sort of be the outsider, I think sometimes, you know, it certainly gives me the freedom to, to be more objective about what the challenges are and how we need to solve them. And to your point, you know, you're, you're not a decision maker. You're an advisor and quite often you encounter situations where a client doesn't agree with you yeah. and that's okay right and i think you know the way that i can get comfortable with that is and this is the bit that's going to sound wrong is i don't care yeah. now it's not that i don't care right that's not a literal um in a, a sort of uh, statement because obviously i do otherwise i wouldn't do what i do and i wouldn't be involved in doing that but it's but it doesn't invalidate me or yeah. what I do, or the value that I hold with what we can provide, if that happens, because again, a lot of what we do is subjective anyway. So you know, it's 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 definitely up for for discussion. But I think you know, when you take all of that and then you apply it to what we do, um, and and the inward looking sort of aspects, is is trying to maintain that that objectivity in terms of what needs to happen. Uh, obviously, you care. <laughs> But but can you do it in, in a in a way that doesn't allow the emotional side of things to take over and lead to you know some sort of irrational outcomes? And I, I think, like I said, I don't I, I don't I don't sit there and, and ponder that, but it's yeah. it's definitely something you do. And and actually, you know, going going forward, it's probably something I might be a bit more structured about, which um which which may help on certain things to have to tackle. But it's an interesting one. I think it's natural and a good advisor, right? But, uh, um, and I think you describe it brilliantly. So you sort of cross the boundary a little. So you stay one foot outside, right? So you've got some detachment. Yeah. At the same time, obviously you want it to work, you know? So it's, uh, it's. Uh, I think you described it perfectly and I really get what you mean by, um, I don't care, but I don't really mean that. You know, that's quite a nice way of summing it up. It is kind of a weird paradox. Um, it is. Yeah. It is. Um, I really like that. So I'm going to move on a little bit and um, I want to ask you, um, a question in a second but um what's really resonating for me about this conversation is uh that we don't often think of ourselves as being like uh like scientists because you know founders and running a business and problem solving and that kind of stuff but my experience of it is very like what you're describing it's very iterative like when you've got to build something new within the business uh you want to build something new you build it with what you've got right now right i think that probably makes sense to you you don't you don't uh, often invent it completely from scratch you've got far enough down a journey um and you think oh what we've got isn't quite right but it's it, having built that structure or that process or that product or that methodology or whatever yeah uh, you suddenly realize that actually you could do this with it once you've got there so you're never doing it completely anew or very rarely mostly you're kind of iterating to take a solution further um mm -hmm. and it, you know it does feel like that sort of inventive uh exciting inventive uh journey um mm -hmm. Of, you know, of working with where we are right now and pushing ahead the knowledge uh, and then seeing it work right so and I've, I think that's quite nice to sort of, sort of like ref reflect on it. it's like maybe the science of business here is um you know trial and error evolution kind of all makes sense it, it really does and I think this is this is sort of back to back to the earlier point as well which is you know the, the ability to let things go and pivot 
depending on what works and what isn't working and there's there's a, there's a flexibility that's inherent in that but but the other things i mean i guess there's there's plenty of material to to look at on this in terms of the growth of the tech industry in the west coast and and that whole fail fast you know fail fast test and learn that iterative process and where you know the agile methodologies have really developed and proliferated wow. from um yeah. but there's there's you know so so i think it, there's a the, there's a being agile. I'm not saying, you know, agile as that methodology, but having that flexibility and, and being able to do that, I think is, is great. Also, there's very few things I think that I've encountered um, that when you sit there in a, you know, in a dark room and, and theorize about stuff that you ever get hundred percent right. You know, there's always something. So, you know, again, and, and this ties into the applying the lessons to your own business as to what you say to clients is quite often just get on with it. You know, yeah. just, just get on with it because yeah. you, you, one thing you can guarantee is you're going to be wrong. Yeah. So, so why don't you figure out what that is more quickly and then be ready to address it. And that, I think that's the point, right? Is don't don't go into it blindly, is is be ready to adjust and hence the agility point. And you can't go in with too much faith. Like you say, you can't go in with too much belief. You have to have kind of this uh, toolbox of conditional belief. Like I rely on that. I can trust that. That will probably work. But it's not, it's never absolute, right? And uh, so there's a, you know, get into it and discover it, get into it and uncover something new. You know, it's, that's, that's the way. And, and I think this, this whole point about, you know, the sort of the mindset and what's important being a founder is, is that whole sort of, you know, I think I guess part of what we're what we're not talking about explicitly, but it's that fear of failure, right? And and what does that do in terms of how it drives your individual behavior? And I think some of the stuff I loved, and I, I really kind of got stuck into this in the early days, um, because I was hoovering up any bit of advice that I could find. Um, and and one of the one of the sort of most ins- inspirational people I've I've kind of come across, I think, is Sarah Blakely, right. um, who founded. I mean, it might be a little odd for me to say this, but she founded the um, underwear brand Spanx right. in the US. So, I mean, without without going into a huge amount of detail on it, it's a really fascinating story about how she founded that business and has been enormously successful. But her thing is she talks a lot about failure, yeah. which, which again is not something that you tend to think about as being foremost in your mind when you're trying to set up a business successfully. Um, but it's all about being comfortable with it. And it, kind of what I mentioned earlier, what's the worst thing that can happen? <clears throat> and and I think, you know, she, she had it ingrained into her from quite an early age that failure was okay because yeah. if you weren't failing, it meant you weren't trying hard enough. Yeah. Um, now, it's, it's very easy to say this in a conversation, right? It's much harder when you actually encounter those things. But I think that's the point. Set yourself up to do that and just don't get knocked off course, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that iterative point is is really important to that. And you sort of get into it, don't you? Get to a point, and certainly I do, and I think I'm picking up on the same from you, where you know you're searching for problems and you're looking for failure. Um, the way I kind of see it is, you know, failure is like clues. It's almost like uh, the curbstones on the road is the failure. The road is somewhere ahead of you, but you know the failures are like the little things you bump up against all along the way that push you back in the right direction. So you kind of like, where's the next failure? Let's find another failure point because we've got to just m- work our way through this kind of this unknown, uncertain path here. To problem solve this there's another thing um like doing the opposite direction like uh, this kind of very innovative chat one of the things that uh, founders sometimes find very difficult is actually uh, not changing stuff i uh, wondered how good you were at that like um it, that's good enough just run it and grow it you know I, um yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm sure none of my colleagues say that i'd be stubborn at all i'm, I'm sure they give you that feedback nick but um I, I think i think you know again you have to you have to be recognizing of where there, there are things that you really believe in and and sometimes yeah it, it is difficult to change your mind um and, and i think <clears throat> again one of the things that i kind of keep challenging myself on is you know the the, the way that we keep going is that growth mindset um yeah. and you know I, I love what i do right i mean i i, I kind of tease my wife and say i've got no plans for retirement actually the, the the retirement option sounds hideous to me like why 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 would you give up what you do that you really enjoy to find something that you like second best so mm. yeah I, and i'm sure there'll be a point where i will express a different view right but right now that's that's how i see it but i think the the understanding for me on when that day might arrive is when i stop being curious about things yeah <clears throat> you know I've, I've always wanted to know more and kind of get stuck into things and you know, it's kind of the so what or why is that, which sometimes can be awkward, you know, in terms of how you're challenging people and kind of, you know, 
just not accepting the status quo um, or seeing that you know rules are a set of guidelines rather than an absolute. And 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 I do appreciate there are some people out there who fundamentally take a different view. So yeah. you know there can be a clash there. But I think for me is that that whole thing about continuing to push yourself mm. um, and feel like you're learning and. And that I think is a mit- certainly for me is a mitigant to that whole. I'm, I've formed an opinion, and I'm not going to move from it. Um, yeah. That doesn't diminish your convictions, right, or your or your appetite, or whatever else. But but I think that that that's something that is uh, certainly how I try and do things. Now I would say that I'm not entirely successful in doing that because you know I think we're human, but <laughs> but it's it's certainly how to how to go about doing that. I, I like all of that. And I think um, just coming back to the kind of root of it, the sort of trial and error, the learn by feedback, the get on with it kind of thing. Um, I, I'm hot. You've got strong convictions, which you update with experience, I would say is kind of, you know, and from my experience, some of them become pretty solid and the updates are subtle. Uh, and there are definitely areas where, you know, I'm not sure that conviction is right yet. You know, it's it's got to be, go in the forge a few more times and get hammered out a few more times before I really feel I know that one right so I do feel like this idea of like learning and and updating uh your conviction uh gives you that nice balance between holding too firmly to something and being flexible it it it, it absolutely does and I, I think everything is a series of stepping stones as well you know the, the bits that we just talked about I think the you know the not being able to do it all by yourself is is a reality that you hit in varying forms very quickly um and it's about understanding you know in terms of building the business is scaling is then finding the uh the the steps that enable you to move on to the next piece and the next piece and you know i i know one of my failings i i i I do say yes to too many things um which i personally i don't think i'd want to change because it's kind of what i enjoy but what 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 I then need to be better at, and we're getting there, is putting those processes and systems in place to enable me to do that, but not be dragged down by it. So so I think you know those those things are all a series of you know, and there's no hard and fast plan to say you know after six months you do this or after twelve months you do that. It's it's very fluid, but you look at it and it is that kind of that sort of ever increasing, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the platform that you you continue to build. Yeah. We've got a great question uh, from Bert just come in and um, Pat's going to take that before we sort of wrap up and then open the forum up to questions. So Bert says it's very interesting, heard a lot about understanding the business, taking opportunities, but a huge part of being a founder is uh, leading others. So um, at what point did you ask yourself, um, can I lead people? Mm. Re- really really good question because i think you know this is one of the topics that back to my last point about being curious is is like a never-ending learning cycle which is which is great because i find it really fascinating but again i i think well a c- couple of thoughts right one is uh maybe this is a bit too sort of positive in outlook but i i haven't i don't think i've really encountered anybody throughout my career that doesn't want to do a good job now there's many that haven't but I, I think the desire has been there. It's just mm. about how to be successful. And I think if I look at a lot of the things that have worked well and contrast to some of the things that haven't worked, you know, again, the big part of it is the environment in which you put around them and how you set them up to succeed. And there's, there's plenty of far more qualified people who studied and, and comment on this. But but I think that that is something that I've kind of held on to and, and seen work in action through yeah. you know various iterations throughout my career. So I think, you know, again, the the leadership point for me is, can you bring people in and can you create the environment where they can be successful? And that is dependent on on a number of different things. And it it links back to the to the tool set that we were talking about earlier. Um, You know, it's finding the right skills of people. It's it's finding the right mindset of, of somebody who's willing to join a small organization, because that's quite different in terms of the expectations compared to. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the bigger organizations but but I think again it's it, you know it, it's it's less about the the sort of the task side of things obviously you need people who are competent and excel in their particular field but can you create that environment whereby they can they can move forward and I, I think that's something that is is always a work in progress for me 
Um, uh, David Hill has asked a question, uh, do you strive for 100% or will you accept 80%? Uh, I think too many founders drive for 100%, which is not necessarily the best. So 80% 80, 80 is pretty ambitious, right? I, I think, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, seriously, I think I'm a, I'm, I'm a celebrated realist. You know, I, yeah. I, I think, I think there's a difference between being a, a perfectionist or somebody who optimizes. And, and I, I firmly believe that somebody who aims for the 80% is optimizing, whereas the perfectionist is going to obsess over the finer details. And, and the 80, 20 rule is, is is re is referred to because it 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 works right it's very real when you look at there's plenty of examples of the Pareto principle in action in all walks of life so yep. so why why try and do something different great answer i hope david that answered your question so um i'm gonna um just say thank you very much matt and uh wrap up the uh kind of recorded discussion to give people a chance just for a few minutes to jump on and see if anyone wants to just chat to you live so we'll do that in just a sec, if that's all right. I'm just going to rattle through a couple of more, a couple more slides, uh, just to give people an update about what's coming next, and then we'll close off the session uh, and bring everybody in just to chat to you for a few minutes if they if they wish to. So thank you, thank you so much for your generosity and uh, answering my questions so eloquently and uh, and so deeply. It's great. Well, thank you. Oh, it's yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, um, lovely slide here from Alice. Uh, what a beautiful picture that is. And uh, I really like having it on here because um, it's gorgeous. And uh, it reminds me that spring is just around the corner. Uh, but also um, it's totemic of um, uh, this idea of um, the growth, uh, the growth cycle and growth mindset and growing a business and putting your roots down and, you know, Oh, it's a lovely, a lovely kind of metaphor for what we've been talking about today. So I love that. Um, next time round, we're going to be asking this big question uh, about trust. I think a lot of people kind of uh, will get this, you know, it's your idea. You worked incredibly hard. It's your passion, your belief, your commitment. You know, try and make that idea come to life. Try and make it succeed. You alone carry the burden, the cash flow, the failure, all the stuff that Matt's just been so eloquently describing, you know. So and then as the owner, therefore, because of that, you know, the final decision is always yours and you often have to dive in to fix things. So, you know, at some point there's too much and you can't do that. You know, the business goes well, it scales up and there's just too much of that. So being right or at least owning the risk of being wrong, it can become a bias. You know, it can become a bias that I'm the only person that's going to be right here. And it can become deeply emotional because of the risks that you feel, you know, that adrenaline rush we talked about. So can that self-made bias be untangled to help you grow as a founder is the question we're going to be posing. And it's a chat between me, Matt and Barbara, um, just reflecting on our experiences of founders who've made that made that transition into scaling up and professionalizing in the next phase. So um, come along on the 30th of March and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you there. And then just a quick shout out for our uh, school. Um, we're running the Leading Yourself School again. Uh, it's a really important foundational part to sort of um, strip down your own uh, car engine and uh, have a look at it all and build it back up again and uh, really examine how your leadership is developing, the things you're finding hard to lean into those wonderful opportunity to work with others and to get some coaching around all of that with some online digital material so take a look at that on our website and if you're interested just let me know and we'll have a chat and we can get you signed up